Uh, Crohn's and colitis, thank you very much for inviting me to come. I was very excited to come. I came up from Toronto uh, last night, made it to Kingston, and then I came up early today. Uh, I have family that lives in Ottawa, so um, I'm watching closely with the water issues and all that sort of stuff. So uh, thank goodness it's sunny. Always gives a little bit of uh, positive feeling. And uh, today is a, a good day, that's what I would say. So my talk is prefaced by the fact that I've been called an ambulance chaser. I've been called uh, someone who looks for trouble. And that's all true. Uh, being a psychologist and having a psychology background, um, my interests in health have been all about people who are in difficult places. Um, my focus is on adjustment, uh, how some people do it really well, how other people struggle with it, and how most people just make it work. And my research over the last 20 years has really been about a process of what we call self-regulation. Now, that doesn't mean that only you uh, can make the difference um, and that it's all on you to make the difference, but the key is how the self operates um, in regards to accepting help from others, uh, in regards to uh, outreach and using organizational uh, benefits uh, and stuff like that. So in some sense, it comes back to the person, but I wanna make sure that we understand that the process of self-regulation is not pointing a finger at anyone who's struggling, but it is pointing a uh, direction on how you might engage something that is difficult to figure out. My mom told me a long time ago, if you run into a wall with your head and uh, you don't knock the wall down and you run into the same wall and you run into the same wall, maybe you should stop running into the wall. And I said, okay, that's good advice. Uh, I didn't quite learn how to turn right with my bike uh, for a while so that she has some evidence that I used to run into walls. So this idea of the research I wanna to present today is an evolving idea, okay? It comes from uh, a long history of stuff that I've been involved with and it's been promoted and, and really driven by patient experiences. So for example, the first couple of projects I'm gonna talk about um, and actually the couple of surprise data that I have to show you too, brand, brand new, like actually two days old, um, uh, all comes from patient engagement. Uh, when we first started in Kingston, uh, through uh, lucky enough to get a real nice grant from Crohn's and Colitis to start this project, series of projects, um, we developed a patient group that informed what they thought the issues were. We aligned our mission with what patients were telling us was important to them, and we went out and we tried to get it done. So I wanna take you through a little bit of a story, if I could, on that adventure. So psychosocial risk factors in pain and uh, quality of life in people managing IBD. So, I come from an area of, of pain and health background. And when we think about what's out there, I always try to position the, the disease or the conditions that I'm working with inside of a larger scope or picture. Uh, several years ago, we had a visceral pain kind of initiative that was worldwide. And if you think about you know, how different conditions fit under that umbrella of visceral pain, you can see here that uh, GI conditions, along with some of the urological conditions on the left here. You can see on the, this side closer to me, you see PPS, that's all urological conditions. We have some OBGYN in the middle, and then we have the GI issues uh, there. So when we think about visceral pain, and we th I think about these other conditions that I've been doing work in over the years, I wanted to do a couple of things. I wanted to test some of the things that we've been seeing in other patient groups, and I wanted to see what's unique inside of IBD. So that's a little bit of background on our story. So I wanna report on three studies. Uh, one is pain phenotyping, and I'll explain that in just a second. The second one is looking at some of the psychosocial factors that are engaged in pain and what those factors sound like. I wanna give you a, sort of a, some sound bites on what they, what they mean and how I think they're uh, best interpreted. 
And then the third one is this idea of quality of life and social support in IBD and how those factors may work with each other. And I have a couple of interesting social support factors to mention. So let's get right into it. When we think about pain and we think about abdominal pelvic pain, uh, obviously it's a cardinal symptom in IBD. We know that there is uh, a vast amount of patients that report pain at one point or another. And what usually takes you to the doctor? Pain, right? It's the number one and primary complaint uh, that we see. So when we were talking early on about pain, our patient group said that for some of them, um, pain was far more present than just in terms of abdominal symptoms. And this made us think, you know, uh, because I talked to the docs and then the docs would say, yeah, like I sometimes have people come in with multiple pain sites, multiple conditions, uh, multiple problems, and then I have someone come in very localized pain. So we were very interested in looking at sort of trying to get a handle on what it looks like from a patient's perspective coming in to report to patient, uh, to physicians. So this work was new, hadn't really been applied in the IBD area, and we thought uh, it's worth doing. So here's a picture of our data of, uh, in terms of what I call pain mapping. And we take pain from a body perspective. So if you look at the panel over here that says IBD pain only, you can see the areas predominantly, and these are roughly about a third, these groups in our population. We had about 300 patients in this study. And you can see here that we have a wide variety if you think of them as columns, right? We have IBD only pain areas that patients identified. Then we have this middle group, which is IBD pain plus one or two other sites is how it broke down. And then the last group would be the more colorful group, colorful group would be IBD pain plus three or more pain sites. And what's interesting about this data to me, it says two things. One, that the patients are right and the doctors are right. That we see a wide ranging set of pain presentations for patients. Not all patients come in with what I would call localized or focal pain complaints. And uh, if you look at the literature on uh, central sensitization and other types of pain mechanisms and how poorly the gut is innervated or has the right nervous connections, um, you can see that sometimes a, a strong pain signaling to one part of, or one organ system or one part of the body gets messy and contaminates, that's the word I like to use, other pain pathways so that you start to have related pain within the area. There's different hypotheses that sometimes if these pain go unchecked, that they actually create a central sensitization, which makes you more prone to other pains that would be related, but may not be as prominent if you didn't have that initiator going on and on and on again, if your pain is persistent uh, and chronic. So there's a bunch of theories that we don't test with this data, but what this data does show us is that for the first time, our patients are multifaceted. They have pain in a variety of different areas, and we have to be watching for that. So for example, what would the far right group kind of look like? What would some of those pains be? Some of it is arthritis. Some of it is uh, extra abdominal pain. Some of it is leg and back pain. We see a lot of that. And you can notice the differences really between the thighs, uh, low back, and hamstrings on these two, on these three slides rather, but on these three columns. So this is really important, I thought, because it sets up a different physical way of acknowledging what patients have been saying, that I present with much more pain, and I think sometimes my doctor doesn't pay attention to that. So if you want to be managed holistically, right, they should know, well, I take this for arthritis, I do this, I have these chronic headaches, I have this. I think that's all part of the presentation. So the days of kind of saying, well, I'm just here to look at that pain, right, I, I hope they're, they're slipping away. I'm, I'm, I'm actually quite positive they are. But I think this data is really helpful in that regard, if nothing else. So this is the other part of the story. And I think it 
it, it makes intuitive sense because the patients were pretty clear in their descriptions of this. And these are some of the measures, the psychological measures, if you will. So we have pain. We have something over here that is about an anxiety about having pain, which makes complete sense because who likes to have pain? Like nobody I know. So the idea is, you know, when you start to feel pain or you anticipate pain, you get anxious about that. You might ruminate about it or think a lot about it. You might magnify it. My mom always said, make a mountain out of a molehill, you know, because you get really worried about it. And then those two sort of features of thinking can sometimes leave you feeling very helpless. Because if you keep thinking about it, nothing changes, and you keep worrying about it, and it just seems to get worse, then helplessness over time is a feature that people experience with that. You think there's nothing you can do. So that's an important characteristic as well. This is a sort of a screen to look at how your mood is going. We could say depression. Uh, and then this is a quality of life measure. So if we look at the different, uh, and I, I apologize for the color here. It could have been a little clearer. But the different groups, remember the columns? These are the columns, and these are the scores and these measures. And we can see there's differences. There's elevations, not in a positive way, on all of these measures across the three groups, which indicates to us pretty clearly that the group of patients who shows up with the greatest amount of pain, on average, reports the greatest amount of distress. That, again, is not rocket science. It just makes sense. But we haven't seen that in the literature yet. And I thought, that's what the patients were reporting to us. So that's, uh, I think, an interesting finding. I think something we can help prepare our physicians for um, when you're managing uh, these diseases. So again, I'll talk probably a little bit more about uh, this little measure here uh, at one point, because it has a funny name. And it's called catastrophizing, OK? And I love it. I mean, my wife's a psychologist. And she knows I've been working with this term for 25 years. And, and I said to her the other day, and I say this often, you are a catastrophizer. And she says to me, that is a nasty word. Like, I don't like that word. And I said, but it's true. You're, you ruminate a little bit more about things in the family. You worry more about the bills. You have more anxiety about different things. You know, like if I forget the kids at daycare, I don't care. I would just, <laughs> I kind of turn around, I go back, I pick them up. You're worried they're going to kick you out of daycare. They're going to call the police. They have a policy. Um, you know, so in some sense, that level of anxiety is important for my family to survive, like to function. So I love that she has that elevation in the anxiousness generally towards life. I love that. It's, it's protective, right? But when it gets to go too far and she starts to get really anxious, loses sleep, feels lonely, has, you know, feels like she's not getting things done, that's when I say, okay, this catastrophizing thing or this, this sort of you know, thoughtful process that is very functional at one point can kind of bite you in the butt at another point. So I think we have to, I want to introduce that construct that way because I think it's a research term. It's not a clinical term. And when you say catastrophizing, I find sometimes patients think, are you saying I'm crazy? And I say, no, no, you're crazy as everyone else. The idea of catastrophizing is that it's just a response, a, a, a cognitive set, a mindset, if you will, that is naturally driven by something that's not fun, pain. So we have to be mindful of that process in a variety of different ways. And you know, the process has been around for a thousand years. It's been written about for a thousand years. It's just we have this term, and I don't know if I like the term so much, so I just say anxious mindset. And people go, OK, that's not so bad. So that's the idea there. And again, we see escalation in that. And I would expect to, as pain becomes far more prominent and troublesome for people. OK? Oh, I'm trying to slide change with that. That doesn't work. So that really was study one. Uh, study two is looking a bit at some of these risk factors. Let me just show the title a bit more. This is an interesting thing. The, you know, this thing here, this, you know, planetary thing, is really nothing more than the amount of clicks and finger drags on my mouse pad. Yeah. 
So that was me after like an hour of work. It looks pretty confusing, eh? It's the life of a psychologist. So risk factors for pain and quality of life, what are they? Here's a picture. And, and I have, I have a, a couple of pictures to show you. So here we're looking at something what I call a full model. And to, to make this make sense, in my head, I always think of it this way. So we have pain over here on the left side of the panel, and we have uh, quality of life over here in green. Uh, so pain is bad. That's why I put it in red and, uh, you know, or something you want to stop. And green is where you want to go. Now, in between, we have these variables that kind of what we call mediate the relationship between these two things. So they, they explain it. Like without that middle variable, those other variables on the end, the red and the green variable, would really not be so strongly related. So this is kind of the analysis, and we call it a mediation analysis. And you can see the variables here. We looked at this lovely thing called catastrophizing. We looked at wellness-focused coping. We looked at illness-focused coping. And we looked at perceived support. And what we found was that catastrophizing and illness-focused coping, and I can explain that more in a minute, were the significant mediators between higher pain and lower quality of life. So in some sense, this analysis tells us that these are important variables to intervene on because they sit in the middle of that relationship, which is so important. So the next couple of slides are breaking down illness-focused coping and breaking down uh, that catastrophizing variable. What of those variables make sense in the prediction? So what particularly makes sense? So we have a couple of variables here, and this is uh, something called guarding, resting, and asking for assistance. And what's really interesting about this data is that the only variable that showed up as being significant for illness-focused coping, and it, it's kind of like what it says. Illness-focused means um, that you have a set of behaviors that are promoted by your illness that uh, aren't necessarily good for recovery. That's one way to think about it. So this guarding variable is a variable that talks about you know, physical kind of withdrawal. Uh, an example of guarding would be I have a sore arm and I walk through the hospital and I keep my sore arm like this. I guard it from other people. It's just a way of, of saying I want to be careful with that. Okay? So guarding can take a variety of different ways. But what's interesting, it is this kind of, I won't say sedentary, that's the wrong term, but it's kind of a protective stance to your behaviors um, that you wouldn't have if you weren't uh, currently suffering uh, from your condition. So that's interesting. So that gives us an idea that we can look to that, have discussions with our patients about that, and see how that might be impacting them. That's an important feature. The second one we want to talk to, again, is this concept of the catastrophizing. Remember before I said uh, rumination, magnification, and helplessness. When we think about helplessness, um, again, as it, as it relates to pain, it's easy to imagine that, in, in my mind, because patients say it's easy to imagine it. Because if you look at pain being persistent, or worse, persistent but erratic, if that makes sense. So we know you're going to have pain on a relatively persistent or consistent sort of uh, experience, but within that, it goes 9 out of 10, 2 out of 10, 3, 1, hey, 0, that's a great day, and then 5, and then 9, 999. Nine, nine. So it can look very, it's not a, a heart rate, it's not a, you know, something that will happen kind of in rhythm, like you don't have that consistency with it. You can go, oh, Friday is going to be a non pain day. I'm going to do whatever I want on Friday. It doesn't work that way. So this, that inconsistency is what bothers a lot of people, okay? Make, and that makes sense to me. We all want consistency. We all would like some control, but we don't get it um, with this condition many times. So the helplessness with pain is also a huge driver 
uh, between pain and poor quality of life, especially emotional quality of life. And I think that's really important to understand. So again, these mechanisms, and I'll talk a little bit about how to treat them in a minute, but I want to identify the mechanisms we have found that our patients have said are important. So that takes me to the third study. We want to look at uh, catastrophizing as a mediator between something that we found very interesting. We found that negative spousal responses are associated with poor quality of life in our patients. That again is a no-brainer. Like, I mean, you think about it. I, I don't invent any new science. I just go out and listen to people and they go, I think this is a problem. And I go, I think you're right. Why don't we test that? So thank you, patients. And I heard from several patients in the first two studies, you know, when I'd asked about family and support, they would say, well, one of the things I have a hard time managing is my spouse. And I say, well, my wife would say the same thing. We all have difficulty managing our spouses uh, to one degree or another. But to be serious, it was, you know, there were sexual issues, there are intimacy issues, there are uh, emotional disclosure issues, there's connection issues. Because many people, when they have a disease or they're suffering through some sort of condition, feel that it's all them. And they don't want to burden somebody else. That's one part of the story. The other part of the story is that if you have some form of dysfunctional communication, and that might be strong language, but dysfunctional communication in some way, that a partner could respond to that in a negative way, where they want to help, but it's like a no-go zone, and they're frustrated, and then you end up with two people who love each other being quite angry with each other. So sometimes spousal responses to pain are negative. And in this example, we saw that negative spousal responses are lead, obviously, to poor quality of life in the patient. And we found that the helplessness that is uh, expressed by the patient is a big predictor of that relationship. So again, it's not a chicken and egg question here. It's kind of like we know that that helplessness towards their pain is part of that tangled kind of relationship issue that patients need to get to. So we need to do a little bit more work there, but we see that catastrophizing, uh, this is an indicator that we need to be thinking more mindfully about that position. Again, we have perceived uh, spousal support being interfered with, again, by the helplessness factor. So this is why I took a little minute to talk about catastrophizing earlier and anxious predisposition so you could understand kind of where the helplessness comes from. This measure of helplessness is driven by pain. Other measures of helplessness or hopelessness could be driven by mood. But this is more of a physical driver. So the argument becomes in terms of pain management, holistic pain management, if we can find markers, targets, intervention points, we want to get them and we want to try to intervene on them. So just a, a thought, when we, when we look at the data, like how, how should I interpret these data? Well, helplessness, I think, shows itself in a variety of different ways. And I think in terms of pain management and just overall management of IBD, I think we need to consider, oh, and I should mention that, you know, the group that we examined, all those patients were, uh, you know, CD and UC patients. Uh, and they were combined in one data set because they were not different on a lot of these kind of uh, predictors and or variables. So that's one large group. That's why I'm using the term IBD and not making a reference to a specific uh, sample. So helplessness is important. I think that's clear on this data. But I think if I go to the social interactions and the models, this is what really I think some of our new wave is working on. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that when I get to the end. And I think it's important for us to understand socially that you know our relationships might be better than they are now if we work on them, or if you're worried or concerned about those, there are people out there that you can talk to for sure. And we know that helplessness is a funny factor because it's a shutdown factor. Helplessness 
and hopelessness are what I call shutdown factors. And they are not a place where I want you to stay. They're a place that I want you to visit and I want you to leave. And I think they're motivators, and I invite people to see them as motivators. When you recognize helplessness, when you recognize hopelessness, when you recognize that distress, now it's time to do something different. Like mom said, you need to learn to steer the bike to the right, okay? Patient care needs to know this, and we're actively promoting this research now. So there's a, a little bit of a model I want to talk about real quick here before I talk about some of our newer research at the end. And this model really fits well. It's an athletic injury model. It is a, a disease model. It is a, a pain model. It's, it's actually pretty cool. And Van Leyen created this probably about ooh, 16 years ago, 17, maybe 20 years ago now. But basically, it takes us through a little bit of experience. And when we think about having an injury or uh, acute pain onset or pain that was acute becoming more chronic, whatever term we want to use for a starting point, we have a starting point. And that leads to pain experience. And there's, a, there's an interesting journey that happens in pain experience. And I like to call it a journey because people that I meet that have pain for some time are tremendously resilient often because it's like you have driven your bike into the wall five or six times and you've learned to drive right and you've learned okay now if i go left here this will be helpful this won't end it this doesn't do this but it makes it manageable and this is part of this journey i want to talk a little bit about so you have pain experience and then if we think about catastrophizing again or the helplessness or the the anxious mindset that we might have when we experience pain and that's normal. Our bodies are not set to go, oh, that's painful. Well, let's do more of it, right? You don't put your hand on a fire or, you know, when you just lean over somewhere and you're talking to a friend nah, and you put your hand on something and it's burning, you don't let that burn and go, oh, I'll get to that in a minute. You remove it immediately and you remove it at your spinal column. It doesn't go to your brain. It goes to your spinal cord and it sends a, a, a response to a, a motor neuron, and the motor neuron jerks your hand away from the fire before you cognitively know that there's pain. So we're built to not have pain. So when we have pain, it's a struggle because we have to educate ourselves over time. And not everybody believes you, not everybody can see it. If we had a pain o meter on our forehead, that clearly went from zero to super red, I think people would go, oh, you're in pain. Wow, okay, I should be more sensitive to you. But we don't have that. We only have what you know, your experience. So it's important uh, to consider it that way. It is a subjective experience. So the anxiousness can then lead to more fear about pain. That can lead to more avoidance, the guarding I was talking about. That can lead to disuse. It can lead to feeling very sad. It can lead to greater disability. And guess what that does to pain experience? It makes more. It makes more. Because when you become sedentary, when you become cranky physically, it just gives you that little bit extra. And if you have pain already existing, remember earlier I talked about, you know, your pain experience is like this, and then you have an acute experience. It's still a breakthrough, right? So this pain experience is something that will vary and it can build upon itself. And that's what we get, uh, that's what I want to help destroy. And part of this, if we think of it as a cycle, is if you intervene on helplessness, if you intervene on how you interpret pain-related uh, experiences, if you inter intervene on disability and disuse, then you're going to reduce the pain experience and start to induce instances where you have less fear or no fear and get a mindset of confrontation against pain and life struggles that leads to a better place. And recovery is a term best described by the patient, okay? That is, I, I could, we could do an eight hour course on this, I'm sorry, but you know, I hope that makes clear my positions on that. I wanna take a second, if you'll let me, to talk about some brand new research, like literally, I put these in the slides like 
on Friday uh, before I went to Toronto. And they're not published, they're so new, uh, I don't even know if I can speak about them. So hold on here, let's see what I can do. So this is the complicated model, and I'll get to that in a second. Uh, this is a really interesting set of research. Patients have said, and support groups have said, we have a variety of people who are really depressed, have been in dark places, and are considering ending their lives. So I said, well, let's go do some research on it. Let's figure this out. Let's see what the situation is. So we started looking at suicidality or feeling pretty terrible about where you are in your life. And this isn't everybody, of course, but we went out and we did a, a survey online, a, a fairly large survey, and we have collected data, and uh, uh, who knows, maybe some of you are even in the room that helped us with this study. And we looked at trying to get a sense of where our patients would be, and in a group of about 400 responders uh, from around the world, by the way, around the world, so we have them from any, a lot of English-speaking places. We have Australia, uh, which is a nice country. You'll meet an Australian later. You should welcome him to Canada. Uh, we have, we have uh, England. We have uh, people who speak English around the world participated. And we're still collecting data. But the data to this point, like on Friday, well, actually Wednesday, and then Friday made it into pictures, talks about this. I don't know if you can read that, and I'm having a hard time myself, but it says, in regards to the general population on a suicide risk screen, a screen, 41% of the patients that we surveyed indicated a flag there, 41%. Now, I wanna temper that. That doesn't mean that we have 41% of the sample trying to commit suicide. That's not what it says but it says that 41% of the sample is reporting significant suicidal ideation and or risk. That blew me away. I thought it was a data error. I thought there's a problem with what we've collected. I thought this cannot be true. We've done everything we can, and unless all the patients that reported this lied to us, it's true. It's an alarming number. It's more than we would have thought. Part of why I think it's elevated, because we also see elevations in depression in some clinical samples and tertiary care samples and so on and so forth, but part of why I think it's elevated is because we've connected to support groups around the world. And many people who are turning to support groups are in places where they feel a bit desperate. Because many patients tell me, I wish I would have went to Crohn's and colitis earlier. Because what I did is I became a silo. I became myself and I tried to manage this and I tried to push through it and I tried to do these things and I didn't actually want help. I've heard that story. But now I realize how important it is to get help from anybody willing to give it. So when I look at these data, I think part of this is we're tapping in to a sample of people who are distressed, who are looking for assistance and help, and that might be part of the elevated number. That said, I've done a recent study in prostate cancer, similar to this, and interstitial cystitis, which is a urological condition, uh, predominantly female, and we have numbers, and we did it the same way, and we have similar numbers, 27%, 34%. So there is something about the alarm button that's being pushed, I don't have all the details. We're gonna work hard over the next couple of years. I'm gonna put in for some more money to try to figure this out. But there's an alarm that clearly I heard, and I think we need to pay attention to it, obviously. So this data will be coming out uh, as soon as we can get it written up and into a journal. I just quickly hear, I'm, I'm worried about time. Um, are we okay for another five minutes or so? Okay, thank you. Um, this slide down here, and I don't know how clearly you see it. I don't see it that clear but I'll try to walk you through it a little bit because uh, it's just small. This was a study that's related to the, the prevalence data that I just talked about. And it looked at what promotes suicidality and risk for being you know, severely depressed and feeling suicidal. Remember, because you feel a little depressed, 
does not mean you're suicidal. Because you have the thought, I wish I would, I'd be better off dead, which would indicate or some, you know, about suicidality, that is actually a very normal thought. A lot of people have that thought. So let's remember that, okay? But in the more severe cases, if I was even to cut this bar in half and say it's 20%, just say just 50% of these people would be at higher risk. That I think is still uh, an abysmal number that we need to do something about. So we took out theory, and this is part of what this squiggly kind of line graph is over here, and this is part of what this diagram is. And you might remember earlier, I showed you sort of a picture that I talked about mediators or variables in the middle. This is similar, okay? But it's a, it has a new feature, we call it serial mediation. Not the food, but the way it works, serial. So we looked at childhood trauma and reports of early childhood trauma and suicide risk in our patients and depression or depressive symptoms and resilience. Because I won't look, I refuse to look at just all negative variables. It doesn't make sense to me. Because I know people are resilient. I know people have features that boost them up. I know they have family members that help. I know those, ex those experiences are there. So I want to try to capture that as well. What we found in our data is that childhood trauma and uh, the report of early childhood trauma, and that can be a variety of things. There's a variety of categories that people reply to. Those patients also report uh, greater depressive symptoms inside of their uh, pain uh, condition or IBD, and that's associated with greater suicide risk. What's interesting is we see that this variable of resilience over here protects against that. So if you're someone who has what we call features of resilience, so you're able to kind of turn some of that rumination over. You're able to kind of go outside and say, I need a timeout. I'm going to walk outside. I'm going to get in the sunshine. Or you have that good conversation. Or you have, there's a variety of ways in which you can be resilient. Part of it is how you think about your space in the world and, and how you meditate on that and how you work with that. Uh, the other part is you go out and you do something different. If what you're doing isn't working, try something different. And the key word is try. Try something different. So for people who do that more often, who try more often, even if they fail, they try again. It's the vacuum salesman. Here we go. I'm gonna, it's a random schedule. I'm not sure when I'm going to sell my next vacuum. But I tell you what, if I don't get out and try to sell vacuums, I'll sell none. I think Wayne Gretzky said it better. I miss 100% of the goals that I don't take a shot on that with. All right. So I think it's the same thing. People who try things are more resilient. And this resiliency acts as a buffer between depressive, depressive symptoms, uh, childhood trauma, uh, and suicide risk. So that makes sense from what we've seen with our patients, and I want to have that message of strength inside of that picture. Although some people are less resilient, as we found them on the surveys at the moment, that doesn't mean people can't be more resilient. This last graphic that I want to quickly talk about um, is again a serial mediation. It runs out and it really tries to break down, if you will, IBD symptoms. We have another variable in here that a lot of patients have been talking about called shame. And we've been thinking about what that means for patients because patients are, are talking about this in social media contexts. They're talking about it in some emerging research and we're looking a little bit at that now. Uh, body pain or average body pain lead to depressive symptoms. That makes sense. From here, we see this variable inside here, and I want to take a look on my screen, which says hopelessness, which is akin to the helplessness factor we talked about earlier. And then we have these two new variables that are related in the suicide risk research of not feeling that you are, that you belong, that you're a burden to other people. That's a big variable, so we want to attack that and make sure that that is well understood. Don't leave that alone. And this other one up top we call psych ache, which is basically pain described as a psychological phenomenon. It's pain that's not physical. It hurts in my thinking. It hurts in my, and if, if, you, if you haven't experienced it, it's hard to kind of get your head around, but think of it as pain that is thought related. And you just want it to stop, but it doesn't stop. 
those two predictors are very important in understanding who ends up being high at risk uh, for suicide risk as we screen it. So I, I, I wanted to show that talking about this at all because I mean, there, this basically lays out a variety, if you will, multiple intervention points for which we need to target our research and our clinical practice. Now, I thought I was done, but I got an email from my PhD student who just sent me uh, actually like 25 minutes ago, some data that I was asking him to do. And we did a randomized controlled trial. We had some patients uh, up here from the Ottawa area and we had a whole bunch of patients in Kingston. And we did a group psychotherapy intervention uh, looking at a lot, targeting a lot of these variables. And what we found over the course of our week, we just looked at the data, it's kind of pilot-ish, -y, but we found that those, that intervention was successful in bringing down catastrophizing, improving mood, and uh, didn't do much with pain, because we wouldn't expect that, but I mean, improving the quality of the life of our patients over the course of as a briefly a 10-week intervention. So I wanna leave on a positive note that I think uh, our research, and I say our because it's not just Dean Tripp, but we have, a, we have an army of people who are working on this stuff, physicians, uh, psychology students and other people, nurses, um, uh, you know, and I, and I want you to understand that although I'm trying to understand the mechanisms, I'm building capacity for change. And the information that you patients feed back, the patients feed back to us should not be lost. It shouldn't be lost. This would not be possible without the patients. This would not be possible without your perspectives. And I wanna thank everyone in the room and I wanna extend that thank you to the people out there because I appreciate your work. Thank you very much.